Hi all, thanks for, for being here. Um, I'm An uh, Anastasios Nanos, along with my colleague uh, Yorgos. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, a unikernel container runtime that we built. We call it URANC. Um, we are going to share a few details about us. We're going to talk about containers, sandbox containers, and unikernels. We're going to present uh, URANC, the tool that we've built, and it can actually boot a unikernel uh, in a cloud native way. And we're going to talk about the integration we have with uh, Kubernetes and uh, um, with, a, with a serverless computing framework. So we are a really small company. We're doing research. We focus on operating systems, virtualization. Uh, we do container runtimes. We expose um, hardware acceleration functionality to workloads running in a, in a sandbox. Uh, we are a team of almost 10. We're uh, researchers, engineers, and software developers. We have, and we have a mixed academic and industry um, background. Uh, we are based in the UK, in Greece, and in Germany. Now, the, the concept of our, of our talk is, is around how, how users deploy their applications in the, in the cloud. So, in, in the figure, you can see a, a, a VM stack, so we've got a host kernel and the hypervisor all together or split. We've got a VM, we've got a guest kernel, some libraries, runtime, stuff like that. We've got the application and some uh, files to, to, to configure the execution of the application. So back in the, in the early days of, of the cloud, users used to um, uh, provision a VM, uh, log into the VM, copy their files, their application, their, their configuration, configure the VM maybe, do some installation, and then run their application. Uh, then containers came, so the um, users were able to develop and package their application on their own infrastructure, on their own laptop, um, create a, um, a container image, uh, send it out to a, to a container um, a registry and then provision this container as is in, in a cloud infrastructure. However, um, cloud vendors saw that there is an issue there. There is an issue with isolation. So co containers do not provide the same degree of isolation as uh, VMs. So what they did is that they sandboxed this container inside the VM. So we've got the same stack as before with the de deployment um, ease of use that, uh, that the containers offer, but we've got a really complicated and bloated stack. Containers are, are, are great. They are lightweight. They offer fast uh, boot times. They, uh, they can run anywhere that there is a um, a container engine. They are scalable. You can run many containers on uh, on a single hardware node, and they offer some kind of isolation, at least in terms of software dependencies. You can run a container with Ubuntu 20.04 and a container with uh, Debian or something else on on, on the same node. Um, and that's the reason they have dominated the whole. Um, uh, cloud deployment uh, um, stuff. They, it's, it's, it's the de facto application packaging and deployment uh, in, in cloud and edge. Uh, containers feature um, a mature ecosystem with many tools. You can do whatever you want. Um, so they are really, really great. However, they have a major drawback. The thing that we mentioned earlier, they they do not provide strong isolation. So they, they share the same kernel, they rely on software components for the isolation, and if you, if you take a look at the CV lists with the container tag, you can check for yourself that there are a lot of, a lot of bugs that allow privileged escalation. So one container can, can easily escape its uh, sandbox. So what, what cloud vendors started to, to do is to deploy tenant containers in an isolated uh, um, sandbox, either software or uh, hardware-assisted. So we've got software solutions like Secomp or 
Aparmor or even Gvisor. And there are VMs. You, we've got micro VMs like Firecracker or Cloud Hypervisor or, or, or other stuff based on uh, Rust VMM. We've got uh, Kemu, like more um, the, like the, the, the traditional VMs, let's say. Um, so we're back again to, to VMs. In terms of uh, uh, deployment, uh, cloud vendors combine the, both worlds, containers and VMs. They keep the benefits of containers, so it's, it's easy to deploy an application um, in, a, in a cloud environment. And they have the same isolation as before, so they can host multiple containers on the same node. However, there are side effects, like there's higher overhead, so we've got, like, uh, we have to provision CPU and memory beforehand um, for, for a container to run in a VM in a, in a hardware node, and there's a complex system stack. So we've got to, um, to put more effort in developing the container runtime that will handle this sandboxed um, container. Let's take a step back, though, because um, users, what they want is to have their application running somewhere. Um, so let's, let's look at what the application needs. Let's assume this is a, a, the, the current state of an application running in a, in a cloud vendor. We've got a sandboxed container, we've got the container runtime, the container, the application, some uh, runtime dependencies, some libraries, and the whole system stack, which is the guest kernel for the VM. We've got a hypervisor, we've got the host kernel and the hardware underneath. Uh, we, we try to, to, to visualize that the, that the application that does not need the entire stack. It needs some, some parts. We have um, identified that as the yellow boxes. So the application needs some parts of the runtime, some parts of the libraries, uh, some parts of the of the guest kernel to interact with the with the hypervisor, and it would end up uh, some, uh, at something like that. So we've got a stripped down version of of the same thing, but only with the things that the application needs to run. It needs the parts of the runtime that uh, interact with the application, the parts of the libraries, and some parts of the operating system. We we have. Uh, we, we call that LibOS, not us, the community. And um, essentially, this, this, uh, this kind of, of, of stripping down exists already, and uh, they, they call that unikernels. So um, um, unikernel is a, is a specialized single address space kernel that is built using a library operating system. So, in, in other words, it's tailored for one application. There is no separation between kernel and uh, user space. And it contains uh, exactly what is needed for the application to run. The, the actual application binary, the configuration, and all the, all the glue code that it needs to interact with the hardware, or with the virtual hardware through the hypervisor. That's uh, almost the same. Um, when, when comparing unikernels to containers, um, they are more lightweight, uh, they provide even faster spawn times, uh, they can run wherever a hypervisor is compatible, so they can run almost anywhere as containers can, uh, they are scalable because of their small footprint, and they are truly isolated because they are based on, on hardware-assisted um, extension. So it's it's it, essentially it's a VM. Um, however, uh, there are challenges on uh, deploying unikernels in a cloud-native way, and these challenges are uh, mainly around the the packaging. Um, and this this means that unikernels, essentially unikernels, are not containers. So the whole tooling around containers, which is really great, it's not there. And unikernels are not VMs, are not typical VMs, uh, because they, they only have one application. So it's a, it's a single application thing. It's a specialized VM. So all the, all, the, all the tooling that exists for containers and VMs 
can be reused but cannot be reused as is. You have to tailor the software stack, the system software stack, for uh, being able to deploy unikernels as containers or as VMs. So we, we have identified two, two main issues. The first one is the, is the packaging. So it seems that if we build the unikernel like an OCI image, because OCI is a well-defined and widely used format, maybe we can bridge the gap between co uh, containers and unikernels. And uh, if, we, if we do that with the image, then we can maybe do something about the execution as a normal, as a, as a container. So container runtimes, they don't know how to handle unikernels. They know how to handle containers. They know how to handle VMs, maybe the sandboxed container runtimes, but not uh, unikernels. So I'm going to give the floor to Yorgos to talk about what we've built. Thank you, Tassos. Hello, everyone. Um, so we came up with uh, URNC, which is a container runtime built specifically for unikernels. Um, it's CRI compatible, it's written in Go. The way it handles unikernel VMs is like processes, so it directly manages the application. Um, it uses OCI images for uh, the unikernels, um, and it makes use of underlying hypervisors to spawn unikernel VMs. So it's easy to add more hypervisors, making it extensible. So let's see how we imagine the OCI image of unikernels. So the, the image includes the unikernel binary, any configuration files uh, required, or uh, HTML files, or whatever the application needs, and a urnc.json file containing any urnc-specific metadata. The produced images can be managed and distributed using any standard tooling we use for container images, like Scopeo, Dive, etc., and can be distributed uh, using uh, container image registries. So uh, to take a closer look, um, we have built a specialized image builder tool. Uh, we call it BIMA. Essentially, it just copies the binary and some extra files and provides with some specific labels for urnc to run. So this is how a sample invocation looks uh, and the sample container file. So now let's take a closer look at uh, the execution flow of uh, urnc. So like in typical containers, uh, container D first pulls the image from a container, container registry, unpacks the image, and then uh, creates the, the prepares the storage backend for the container to run. So in our case, after that, it invokes urnc, passes the, the storage uh, backend and the bundle, and urnc then spawns the unikernel. Now, if we want to take a closer, even closer look, uh, we can see how this whole thing works. So container dsim first invokes urnc create. Um, urnc create then forks itself, essentially creating a new process, a re-exec process, which is uh, spawned in a new network namespace. And uh, this process, once it starts, it uh, notifies the parent process that it had booted. Then the parent process uh, saves the, the state and uh, executes any create runtime hooks, and then sends an OK message, an ACK message to the re-exec process, executes any create container hooks, and takes it gracefully. So container dsim gets notified. <clears throat> so then it invokes urnc start. Um, what this essentially does is just notifies the re-exec process, it's OK, we can start, and executes any post-start hooks. So this is, I think, the most uh, interesting part. Uh, now the re-exec process uh, sets up the networking and the storage components, executes any start container hooks, and essentially replaces itself with the unikernel VMM process. So uh, for the networking, we have decided we can use the VEF uh, endpoint that CNI plugin provides us. And in order to provide networking for our unikernel, we create a new tab device inside the container network namespace. And using uh, traffic control redirection, we map all incoming traffic to the map interface and all outgoing traffic to the VE endpoint. So we can then pass the tab device to the VMM. 
Um, the current state of, uh, of storage handling is that uh, we first extract the unikernel binary from the container image, the root fish, and then we attach the storage backend to the unikernel. So as you can see, um, these are the layers, the root fish layers, and we have the unikernel binary, then some configuration files, the HTML files, etc., our uh, urnc.json file, of course, and all the configuration files are uh, inside the DevMapper blog device. So now we have seen how urnc runs. So what can we do with it? We can deploy uh, a solo 5 ramp run nginx, for example, unikernel using standard uh, container tooling. So to do this, we first need to create our container file. As you can see, we just copy the unikernel binary, the configuration files, and the HTML files, and provide the required labels. Um, we can see now the, the configuration is uh, a simple Nginx configuration, and the HTML is also a really simple HTML file. Nothing special here. So now, using Bima, we define the tag, we define uh, the <clears throat> which file we want to use, which Docker file we want to use, or container file, and the build context. So now we just build the image, and we can now push it to a registry, just like any other normal uh, container image. Okay, so now we can run our uh, unikernel uh, using uh, just uh, standard uh, NERDSTL we have to define the container runtime we're going to use. So we will define that, you can see. And we will also need to define the, the snapshotter. In our case, we use DevMapper. And of course, the, the image we want to run. So as you can see, it boots. Um, sorry, I think I pressed it. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> I pressed it forward. So it was normally, okay, so Nginx now running. And we can see that uh, if we inspect the processes, we can find the solo 5 process running. We can also curl our Nginx and hopefully, it, yeah, it responds. So uh, it's that simple to take a unikernel binary, build it into an OCI image, and run it using an HTL. However, we think there are also some uh, other use cases, uh, more complex perhaps, that are really, th that they would really benefit from unikernels. For example, serverless functions, uh, uh, software as a service, and of course, edge deployments where our devices are usually res resource constrained. So let's see how we can integrate that uh, URNC with uh, Kubernetes. Now, the main challenge we had is that in order to deploy Kubernetes pods, you need to, to handle non-unikernel containers. For example, the post container of the pod or any other sidecar container. Now, to achieve this, we use RunC. So any generic container gets spawned using RunC. And then the user-defined container, which is a unikernel in our case, is spawned using URNC inside the same pod. So let's see an example of how this looks like. So here we will build the simple Nginx uh, unikernel using Unicraft. As you can see, it's, uh, it's really fast. <laughs> um, and once the unikernel is built, we will just copy the, the binary. Um, some template files, and we can just create now our container file. As before, we copy the, the binary, we label any necessary run C metadata. We push the image. OK, we can run it with NerdCTL to check everything runs OK. It boots everything is OK. So now let's uh, see how uh, a, a Kubernetes uh, deployment YAML looks like. So it's pretty standard as well. We can just apply it. And as you can see, it just booted. We can also curl it, get a response. So this is how easily it e e how easy it is to use unikernels and urnc to deploy um, 
unikernels in Kubernetes. So Tassos, if you would like to join me, and so something even more uh, elaborate. Thank you. So, yeah, we, we saw that we have uh, URNC, we can deploy stuff on uh, Kubernetes, uh, unikernels, Unicraft, uh, Rampran, Solofire, whatever. Uh, and the, the, the ultimate goal that, that we had in mind is to, to optimize the serverless computing uh, approach. So we, we, we thought let's, let's take a, um, a popular framework, a, a, a popular serverless framework, Knative, which is built in Kubernetes, it's open source, it's platform agnostic, and in, in, in Knative, the, the user code is essentially um, a container. There's no sandboxing or isolation or stuff like that. The way that Knative works uh, is kind of shown in this, in this figure. It's the, the architecture. So we've got uh, clients on the, on the left side that talk to an ingress controller. This is outside the Knative stack. Uh, the ingress controller talks to an activator. The, uh, this is part of the Knative stack. The activator has a queue. It talks to the autoscaler. The autoscaler sees uh, there is no deployment available for this kind of uh, function. Let's spawn a pod. So it talks to the, it creates a deployment file and spawns a Knative pod. Now, in, in this pod, there's the, the queue proxy container, which is uh, essentially it handles metrics and it manages the incoming requests and the responses, of course. And this queue proxy container talks to a user container. This is the container that runs the actual user code. Uh, if, if, uh, now, the, this is for the first invocation. The, uh, other invocations after that just go through ingress controller. There is a map to the queue proxy container and then directly to the, to the, to the user function. The queue proxy container also pushes metrics to the autoscaler to scale uh, up and down the, the pods, the relevant Knative function pods. So if, if a user, if a, if a cloud vendor, sorry, if a, if a cloud vendor wanted to, to sandbox the user code running on their infrastructure, they could use something like uh, generic container sandboxing mechanisms, like uh, like the Kata containers, like uh, I don't know, Gvisor maybe something something more elaborate, uh, where they would sandbox the user container and the Kubernetes proxy container, the whole Knative function pod, um, in a in a in a micro VM. Uh, that that would offer a strong isolation because the user code is sandboxed uh, in, in, in inside something that has hardware assisted isolation uh, it would offer um, fair scale scalability because um, you have to provision for the resources of the vm let me remind you that a sandbox container in a micro vm has to boot linux so there's a whole new stack uh, the kernel a root of libcontainerd again and stuff like that and that, that ends up to having increased CPU and memory footprint. So what we think is that you cannot fit many sandbox container, uh, containers like these on a, on a single node. So we thought let's, let's use URNC to spawn Knative functions uh, for, uh, for the user code. So we've got the benefits of the sandboxing uh, approach, so we've got strong isolation, and we've got the same or even better scalability than uh, uh, than, than containers and generic uh, containers, uh, because unikernels are uh, smaller. They have small smaller memory footprint. They have smaller images, so you might get even faster boot times. And to show that this thing works, we have prepared the. Uh, short um, demo let me okay so we we build a, a simple knative um, uh, function it's a unicraft http reply um, uh, unikernel uh, we have not put uh, any 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 speed in this uh, approach because it's it's even faster than nginx so it just builds 
LWIP and the simple main.c file, which is the HTTP reply. <laughs> Uh, we build our, our um, image folder, we build the container file, we copy the unique kernel binary, um, no need for intrd. We build the image using Bima, we push the image to our registry, we run it to make sure that this thing boots, it boots, of course, and then we create the descriptor for the, for the service function. We internally, we've got a, um, an ingress controller to handle uh, FQDNs and... Uh, HTTPS certificates, which is not shown here, but it's easy to uh, show you if you want. So the, the descriptor here for the k-native function, we define the name, we define some scaling parameters, we define the affinity, which is irrelevant to this um, case, we define the runtime class, which is you run C, and we also share the, the, the image that uh, we uh, built earlier. And we, we apply that, so this is registered as a k-native function, and if we do a curl to this, uh, to this address, we get the HTTP reply. So it's just, uh, it, it, copy, it just copies the headers that it took. That's the simple um, function. And if we, if we inspect the pods, we can see that the pod uh, booted, and it terminates because we have set a, a low uh, scale down um, timeout. Um, that's all from, uh, from us. So we, we think containers are great, but they lack isolation. Uh, in order to, to avoid the um, multi-tenancy issues due to isolation, cloud vendors uh, revert back to VMs for, uh, for isolation, to micro VMs, so that leads to a bloated and redundant system stack. And we think that unikernels could be a viable alternative for many use cases, uh, serverless computing, edge computing, stuff like that. We uh, have shown uh, Uran C, which we consider the missing component for bridging the gap of uh, unikernels and containers, bringing containers closer to the cloud native world. Um, we have the code online, so you can scan the QR code, you can go on GitHub and check it out. It's Nubificus Uran C, Nubificus Bima for the helper tool. Um, we would like to mention that this, uh, this work is part of uh, two EU-funded projects, uh, Serrano and 5G Complete. And we are more than happy to take any questions, um, see if you, if you like it or not. Uh, for the... For the for actually picking it up, are you using Unicraft as KVM? So, for the Unicraft execution, yes. For, uh, for the RAMP run execution, we use Solo 5. Okay, and is that is it Solo 5 provided? Solo, Solo 5, KVM? yes, it uses KVM. Solo 5 has two modes, so they, they, have, they, they have a naming issue, Solo 5. So, they, they have named the, 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 the bindings, the unikernel bindings, and the, and the tenders and the hypervisor, Solo 5. So, it's... They've got a software mode in their paper, Unicameras as process, I think. So there's uh, Solo 5 SPT, which is the SecComp enabled um, isolation. And there's Solo 5 HVT, which is KVM. Essentially, so they do VCPU create, memory set, and spawn. How does this happen? Does you, uh, is URAC invoking the, let's say, the proper command to start a specific unicamera? Yes. Yes. So it's. Uh, it's forking. I mean, you mentioned that it reexecs some different. Yeah. So the 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 reexec stuff is uh, pretty standard run C stuff. Okay. So it's. Uh, uh, yeah. So that, I wanted to, that's the exec the unicorn on VM. So that's where you create a let's say a queue process or a solo file process or whatever that. Means. Exactly. So so if you if you if you take a look at the annotations, so we've got. <laughs> I cannot see the dot, but anyway, if, at, at the last line you see hypervisor chemo, unicamera type rampran. Uh, for the for the Unicraft uh, example, the nginx hypervisor is uh, uh, chemo, unicamera type uh, um, Unicraft. For the Solo 5 case, the first nginx example, hypervisor was HVT, uh, unicamera type rampran.
So, Jorgo, you want to take this? So, we are using Spark Cafe Milpa because it's fast, it's kind of, it's, it's very good compared to him. Uh, if I want to integrate that with Iran C, is there any sort of major update or we just have to be uh, at the configuration in the uh, I, I think it's it, it will be straight, uh, pretty straightforward. You just have to, like, replace the, create a new firecracker. Yeah, okay. Opening a can of worms, <laughs> you are <laughs> so. Regarding the, the first thing, I, I, I just wanted to, to share that it's it's Go, so it's Go packages. Mm -hmm. So you you inherit the hypervisor class or whatever this mm -hmm. thing is called. Mm -hmm. Go, and you you implement your own. So to implement a different hypervisor package, just like that. So for the networking and the tab stuff, this is really really tricky. Um, so what, what people do usually, I, I don't know what you guys do, but uh, what people do uh, in the Kata containers um, world, they have a tap device, they have uh, an Ethernet, the, the Ethernet pair from the, uh, from the VF endpoint, and they, and they bridge them. They don't use yeah. bridge because it's, uh, uh, it, it has an overhead, they use TC direct, which is fine. Now, if, <laughs> if you put another 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 unicamer there, or another sandbox container there, another another VM, you have an issue because how how are you going to handle traffic? There are no IPs. Then you have to do smart stuff with IP tables. Um, but in the in the Kata case, there's no issue because the pod has all the containers inside, so it's one sandbox and many many containers, one pod and many containers. In our case, it's a bit different in the in, in the in the, in the unicamer stuff. There's no, ah, sorry, roadmap. In the, in the container world, you have a network namespace and you have localhost. So you, all the containers talk to localhost and that's fine. In the unikernel world, localhost is, is a whole different story. So if you put a second unikernel, you have to do really, really tricky stuff for the network. Yes. Uh, so it's, it's, it's complicated. We're, we're, we're trying to figure out how, how this should work. We have some, uh, Initial implementation, but uh, we think that we should work a bit more on that, maybe together. Okay. Is there any number? Performance number? We have some numbers, but we wanted to validate them before we show. So it's uh, numbers look, look good. It's uh, it's a first prototype, so it's fully unoptimized. Uh, I, I would dare to say that it's uh, it's almost as good as Run C. There are cases we, where it, it is better, but some people from the team thought we should validate the results before we show them, so it's uh, we won't show them. So what's your goal? Your goal? Goal or number? Your party number. You want to like ten milliseconds and one hundred milliseconds. So we've got. We've got two goals. The, the first one is be uh, be able to spawn and host as much uh, containers as as possible on on the same node. So to pack them to to show that unikernels have a really really small footprint. Okay. That's that's one thing. The the second thing is to 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 show the cold boot time, which is kind of tricky. How to, how to measure that? It's it's it's, it's really tricky what people call um, call good time. And, um, and the third one is show how, how fast the unicorns can handle I.O. So how, how fast they can handle network. We, we don't have a specific number in, uh, in mind because there are a lot of numbers going around and I, I, I'm not entirely sure where we, we are comparing apples to apples. So there are milliseconds, there are some milliseconds, there, there, there are a lot of stuff, but yeah, we, we will definitely go for the for the cold boot for 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 something like uh, using Firecracker with Unicraft because we we haven't been there yet. Um, we definitely want to explore the the, the SPT, the SecComp stuff, um, the Divisor stuff. Uh, 
we, we have no experience, but we, we tried it out with the K Native. It seemed like great, but it, it had a bit of overhead compared to generic containers. So it was maybe we need to, to spend some time there, some more time to understand a bit more. So there's 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 a lot of uh, open stuff to check. Okay. Is it, is it cost any Ah, uh, yeah. So uh, that's <laughs> yeah. That, that's an, another issue. That's that, that's another fork uh, that we're working on. So in in, in order to to package a, a user function into a unikernel, you have to have some kind of build system. So we we. You, you, you cannot run uh, whatever you want. There's some work from uh, from Unicraft where you can take a container and have a Linux compatibility layer, a shim, and you can run a, a, a generic container as a Unicraft Unicare. Uh, we need to try that first, of course. We, we have the, default, the, the default way now. So. The default way, yeah, okay. It, That's it, nice. It's, it's, it's easier to actually deploy this. For people, if they buy something, it's pretty difficult. So we can take that as is and spawn a k-native function from a Docker container. Mm -hmm. uh, one, I mean, this is something that has been private, but I'm wondering what would, you, what, would, what would be your requirements from the great digital community with respect to providing, let's say, what you need to make this happen? I mean, of course, there's going to be applications that are as part of doing products. Um, we are going to work on uh, expanding, let's say, the platform support. So some requirements from your side as kind of designers of currency and tying this up to the greater country and ecosystem. So if it, it would be great if you guys provided this, what would be that this, apart from more applications running and more platform being supported? So I, I, I think that uh, one, one of the major challenges is the, the unification of the storage and network handles. Storage. And so this, okay, this is yeah. like a real, a real pain. I mean, in the, here we, we, we do we do some hacks to make that work and with with Unicraft and Kemu uh, because there is Virtual FS that's fine with Firecracker we cannot do that we yeah, need the mapper. It's currently in Italy. It's you just take the image and feed it into memory. So with no, with, no right. with Solo Five uh, same thing. It's it's so it's storage it's and persistence and networking. Storage persistence persistence and networking. Storage is one thing which is messy, and the other thing is the network, like, I mean, the tap interfaces and the TC filters and what happens when you have another one. That's, that's a bit tricky. Yeah, there are some queries also about DNS and how would someone integrate the other one if you have an NTP, so yeah, there are other challenges there, right? I, I see. Mm -hmm. Thanks. In which web OS are you, at which web OS project are you using? So we, we have used Unicraft, we have used, uh, in, in our presentation, we have used Unicraft, we have used uh, Rampram, uh, but uh, Rampram was running over Solo 5, so essentially we can use Solo 5. At the moment, that's the two stuff that we support. Yeah, can you run the multi-process containers that run more than one? We just had a discussion earlier today in the community about that. Yeah, so multi-process uh, applications inside the same unikernel, I'm not sure. These are the experts. Um, uh, we're what, working I don't towards know. that. We're working towards that. There was a lot of discussion today about the judge right now. Yeah, we can talk about that, yeah. I mean, this discussion with GS and TLS and the other items, it's a mess, it can be done, but it's going to be a bit of maybe in the But in terms of multiple containers for both, uh, we can do that. So yeah, you okay. can have a generic container and a couple of unikernel containers and they, they all can share the same, let's say, sample. Yeah, I know. Uh, the problem is uh, the, the task scheduler needs different address spaces. Yeah, yes. there's, there's also a problem, for example, Postgre is, let's say, notoriously anti multi -threading. So Postgre, we, we couldn't actually port at this point on top of Unicraft because it is multi-processing. There's some work done to having multi Many applications are I know, I know. If you look for the engineers, even for RAPAN, it says they are master process off because yeah, it's yeah. only one. <laughs> it's the same with the same as well. Okay, so
Thank you very much. Thank you.